So this is one of the first mentions of nutrition today, specifically related to autoimmunity. And I would say sugar is a big deal for people with RA. You know, it takes about 75 grams of sugar to weaken the immune system. And once the white blood cells are affected, it's the immune system's activity is lowered for about five hours after. So it basically stuns the immune system. <laughs> and a study evaluating women from the nurses' health study showed that women who consumed greater than one serving of sugar sweetened sodas per day had a 63% increased risk of developing RA compared with those who consumed no sugar sweetened sodas or who consumed less than one a month. And no effect was seen for diet soda. So clearly there's a relationship between sugar and maybe even high fructose corn syrup and RA. Food sensitivities, got to talk about food sensitivities and inflammatory foods, especially with an inflammatory related condition like this. And often patients with RA experience improvements in symptoms while fasting and numerous studies have shown food sensitivities as a triggering factor or etiological factor in RA. So it's really important that we identify patient specific food reactions so that they can get better. IgG, IgA, and IgM antibodies to dietary antigens were measured in both the serum and also the jejunal perfusion fluid. So this is part of our uh, small intestine from 14 RA patients and 20 healthy subjects. And the antigens originated from cow's milk, cereals, chicken egg, codfish, and pork meat. Uh, in the intestinal fluid of many of the RA patients, all three immunoglobulin classes showed increased food specific activity. So Really, we need to be looking at some of our big guns, as I always call them, you know, our dairy, maybe gluten here, eggs, uh, and some people, pork is not the, the best food overall, it does tend to be a little inflammatory as well. So fatty acids, I think, are very important when it comes to RA. Again, looking back at the kind of this inflammatory related condition, several sources of information suggest that human beings evolved on a diet with a ratio of the omega-6 to omega-3 essential fatty acids of about one Whereas in the Western diet, the ratio is anywhere from 15 to 16.7 to one. So 15 times what it should be or what we evolved on. And the excessive amounts of the omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids, otherwise known as PUFAs, and a very high omega-6 to three ratio, as is found in today's Western diets, promote the pathogenesis of a lot of inflammatory related conditions, cardiovascular problems, cancer, inflammatory conditions, autoimmune disease. Whereas increased levels of omega-3s exert suppressive effects. There have been specific studies looking at RA and the ratio and an RA consuming a ratio of two to three to one suppressed inflammation in one study. That's great. So the lower the ratio that we can get, the better people will be, especially when, as, it, as it pertains to inflammation. It's quite possible that the therapeutic dose of omega-3 acids will depend on the degree of severity of the disease resulting from the genetic predisposition. So some patients might require more, some patients less, depending upon what's going on with them. So here's our uh, major inflammatory related pathway here. We have leukotrienes here. We have omega-6s and omega-3s that eventually work their way down. And as you can see on this side here, we're promoting prostaglandin, PGE2, and thromb thromboxanes that typically are more pro-inflammatory related, increased inflammation, decreased vasodilation, increased platelet aggregation. So kind of more of the what you would think of in terms of the cardiovascular disease realm and just overall more inflamed. On the right over here, we have omega-3s, our, our EPA. Again, it contributes down this side of the pathway where we have PGE3, prostaglandin, and thromboxane A3. These relate to decreased inflammation, right? And also the regulation of inflammation, blood pressure, and heart rhythm. So clearly it has an effect on cardiovascular system and beyond, including our autoimmune problems as well. So where are we getting all the omega-6s from? That's the question. And a lot of it's coming from our processed vegetable oils. So safflower oil, sunflower oil, corn oil, soybean oil, sunflower seeds, walnuts, pumpkin seeds, corn and soy fed animals, which the majority of animals are fed corn and soy. Uh, so this is where we're getting a lot of our omega-6s. Where do we get our omega-3s from? Primarily from oily fish like salmon, herring, mackerel, small fish, fish oil, flaxseed oil, flax seeds, walnuts, chia seeds, and then grass fed, grass finished animals. 100% grass fed animals have been fed grass their entire lives. And these, the grass of course contains high levels of omega-3s. Uh, omega-9 fatty acids, is also important here, and olive oil is the highest source of omega-9s. I wanted to kind of just briefly talk about nuts because everybody is 
all into nuts <laughs> and, and how great they are for you. They're a great source of protein and a great snack. I just would say to use caution with nuts, especially those that have a higher omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, because they can ultimately contribute to this higher level of omega-6s in the body. You still have to use caution and balance in your diet. For example, walnuts have a 4.2 omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. That's pretty low. For anything between, between one to four, I would consider pretty good. Macadamia nuts, 6.63. And of course, they're just delicious and so fatty and, and amazing. <laughs> Cashews, 47. 47. Almonds, 278 omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And peanuts, 1720. So some of these things, I think we kind of have to think about a little bit deeper as we stick them into our mouth. <laughs> One thing I do like to use clinically in my practice to look at people's omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is looking at a omega-3 index. And you can do this test from a variety of companies. And so you, this actually gives them an index of how well they're doing with their omega-3s. So this particular patient here at a 4.6% index and you can see that it's below the target range of 8%. So clearly they need to bump up their omega-3s a little bit. And it also gives them specific values for each of their omega-3 fatty acids, the primary ones, and their omega-6 fatty acids over here. So you can calculate the ratio. So this patient over here had 34 to 7, which is roughly a little less than 5. So roughly 4 point something to 1, which is not bad. So, and then it also gives them sources of how they can get higher omega-3s in their diet too. So this is a great test. I really like this, especially um, as you start to work with patients who have these inflammatory related conditions. Vitamin D and RA, vitamin D deficiency has been implicated in the pathogenesis of autoimmune disease and reduced uh, vitamin D intake has been linked to increased susceptibility to the development of RA and vitamin D deficiency has been found to be associated with disease activity in patients with RA. And one study here, this is a cohort of 44 patients with RA their vitamin D levels were found to be low compared with the control group being 15.6 compared to 25.8. Both of those are very low, but the RA patients had substantially lower levels. And they were also, the levels were also found to be negatively correlated to CRP and ESR. So clearly the higher the level of vitamin D, the less inflamed that they might be. In an autoimmune response, vitamin D is actually involved in maintaining an optimum balance between Th1 and Th2 to suppress the autoimmune response mediated by T cells and by regulating the CD4 cell production and activity and halting antigen representation. So, so vitamin D has a lot of very important roles in the immune system, of course, as we all know at this point in time, but it's important to see that visually.